Today we're going to take a look at the Heathkit IO-12 oscilloscope. This is a piece of vintage electronics from the 1960s. I'll discuss some of the history of Heathkit scopes, including this one. We'll go over its features and specifications, take a look inside. I'll review the front panel controls and I'll give a demonstration of it operating. So what is an oscilloscope? Well, you can read all about oscilloscopes on any number of sites on the internet, but basically a scope shows a visual representation of a voltage. Typically it shows voltage on the vertical axis and time on the horizontal, but there are other modes like XY that can show voltages on both axes. Basically an oscilloscope lets you visually see a signal, unlike a meter which only tells you its magnitude. So that makes them indispensable for looking at complex signals like those found in radio, television, and computer circuits. They've been commonly used going back at least to the 1920s and are still used today. Typically scopes have been relatively expensive and sometimes outside the budget of students or hobbyists. They originally used cathode ray tubes like television sets used to, but modern scopes are generally switched to using LED or LCD displays. They still tend to be expensive, but in the last few years some very high performance scopes, and by high performance I mean uh, dual channel 100 MHz bandwidth scopes from companies like Rigol, Siglent, and Handtech have become available for under about $500 US. As you probably know, Heathkit was a maker of electronics, uh, mostly in kit form. In fact, their first electronic kit was an oscilloscope, the O1, that was offered in 1947. Heathkit found that by offering it as a kit that the user would assemble and making use of war surplus parts, it could be sold at a price of $39.50, significantly less than commercially assembled units at the time. The O1 was quickly followed up by the O2, O3, O4, and O5 over the next couple of years. In subsequent years, Heathkit made over 60 different models of oscilloscopes. They even made some higher end scopes that tried to compete with the big makers like HP and Tektronix. The highest end scope that they offered was the IO4360, which was a triple tray 60 MHz scope offered from 1984 to 85 for about $1,000 US and had an optional time display module that sold for another $350. This unit on the right is a Heathkit IO4205 dual channel scope that was sold in the early 1980s. I've made another YouTube video on this particular unit. In this video we'll be looking at the IO12 oscilloscope. It was advertised as an extra duty wide band oscilloscope with a full 5 MHz bandwidth for color TV servicing. It was said to be our most popular, most versatile oscilloscope when it was offered from 1962 to 1968. This is a 1964 Canadian Heathkit catalog that has an entry for this scope along with some other scopes. It typically sold for a price of US dollars 79.95. It replaced the earlier IO30 which was electrically identical but had different styling. And it was subsequently replaced by the IO18 in 1968 which was also identical but restyled with different knobs and color scheme. So for that price, you got the scope, but probes were extra and cost $7.50 each if you opted for the PK-1, but most people likely just used wire test leads. There also was an IO-12U model for the UK and Europe that ran on 230 volt power. The basic features of the IO-12 were the following. It had a green 5-inch round CRT display. The vertical input had three ranges, marked times 1, times 10, and times 100 as well as a variable attenuator and the maximum sensitivity was 25 millivolts per inch. The vertical frequency response was plus or minus 1 dB from 8 Hertz to 2.5 megahertz and plus 1.5 to minus 4 dB from 3 Hertz to 5 megahertz. The input impedance was about 3 mega ohms depending on the range. The vertical ranges are not calibrated but they can be calibrated against a provided 1 volt peak to peak signal source. The horizontal channel has a sensitivity of 0.3 volts per inch and a frequency response plus or minus 1 dB from 1 Hz to 200 kHz and within 3 dB up to 400 kHz. The horizontal sweep is adjustable in five ranges from 10 Hz to 500 kHz and it also has two fixed sweep frequencies. It's not a triggered sweep like more modern scopes but uses a recurrent sweep with a sync circuit that synchronizes the sweep generator with the input signal which has to be repetitive. There's also a z-axis intensity modulation input that's accessible from the rear panel. It's got a built-in power supply and runs on 105 to 125 volts AC 50 or 60 Hertz. It weighs 20 and a half pounds, uses 11 tubes including the CRT, 
And some of these are dual tubes, so it's equivalent to having 18 tubes. The tube lineup is a 1V2, a 5UP1 CRT, 6AB4, 6A and 8, 6C4, 6CA4, 6J6, 312AU7s, and a 12BH7. So let's take a look inside. Like most oscilloscopes, the size of the case is determined by the large CRT. It's about 14 inches or 35 centimeters deep. Most of the wiring is on two printed circuit boards with some point-to-point -point wiring, mostly to the front panel controls. The assembly was simplified by a factory assembled wiring harness. The brown colored printed circuit boards are made from a phenolic material, which is not as good as a more modern fiberglass material. The traces tend to lift if they're overheated when soldering or desoldering. They're single-sided and silk-screened. As is typical for CRT-based scopes, there's some pretty high voltages present, up to 1200 volts DC, especially at the back and around the top controls. The manual specifically warns to be careful making certain adjustments. I've actually replaced the large electrolytic caps and the paper caps. I'll discuss that later when I talk about the restoration of this unit. It's interesting that most of the tubes, including the CRT, are marked Daystrom, or made for Daystrom, which was Heathkit's parent company at the time, uh, which gives an indication of the buying power of Heathkit in those days. Here's another view of the other side showing the other half of this printed circuit board, which has a shield between the two halves and the printed circuit board at the back. And looking at the back is the bottom of the other circuit board, the socket for the CRT, and this is the Z-axis input that's accessible through a cover in the rear panel. So let's put it back in the case and we can turn it on and look at some of the front panel controls. So on the rear panel we've got the line cord, a fuse, and a cover that provides access to the Z-axis input which tended to be rarely used. The CRT is a 5 inch green circular unit. The graticule, the markings on the screen here, are a little unusual by today's standards. It's got markings for 1, 2, and 3 volts peak to peak, where modern scopes usually have just a grid of vertical and horizontal lines. It's also marked in inches rather than the more common centimeters today. It's got four screws around the CRT for mounting an optional camera to take an image of the trace. At top right is the power control and intensity, which adjusts the brightness of the display. The pilot lamp at the bottom center here indicates power on. Below brightness is a control that adjusts the focus of the display. Then we have vertical and horizontal position. The vertical input range switch has ranges of times 1, times 10, and times 100. And then there is a continuously variable vertical gain control marked from 10 to 100. The vertical input and ground are here at the bottom left. The horizontal channel controls include the horizontal gain, the horizontal frequency selector, and the horizontal frequency vernier that goes from 10 to 100. The horizontal range can be set to one of five ranges, 10 to 100 hertz, 100 to 1000 hertz, 1 to 10 kilohertz, 10 to 100 kilohertz, and 100 to 500 kilohertz. You can also select two preset horizontal sweep frequencies that are set using two trimmer caps that can be adjusted behind these holes here. These are often adjusted to correspond to sweep rates that would be suitable for television servicing, typically to show two cycles of the television vertical and television horizontal sweep, typically running at 60 hertz and around 15 kilohertz. You can also set the horizontal sweep to the 60 hertz line frequency or to the external horizontal input jack. Selecting external input essentially puts it in XY mode. The sync selector switch allows selecting to synchronize on the negative or positive edge of the vertical input signal, the line frequency, or an external sync input. When using external sync, the external sync selector switch adjusts the gain applied to the input signal. When using line sync, the phase control adjusts the phase angle of the sync signal derived from the AC line. A 1 volt peak to peak jack provides an approximate 1 volt peak to peak AC signal that can be used to calibrate the input. By connecting it to the vertical input jack and adjusting the vertical gain, you can calibrate the display. For example, if it's adjusted so that the trace shows 1 inch on the times 10 range, then the input will be calibrated for 1 volt per inch. Switching to the times 1 range, the display will indicate 0.1 volt per inch, 
and at times 100 it'll correspond to 10 volts per inch. I purchased this unit from a local seller on Kijiji. He said he got it from an estate sale and they didn't know any more about it. He claimed it powered on and it showed wiggly lines, but he didn't know how to use it. It looked complete. It had the original knobs, a little bit of rust on the case, and uh, apparently no modifications on the outside, which was a good sign. There were a few dents on the case. There was no manual, but I found a partial manual on the internet. So he gave it an initial inspection and some minor cleaning, and then powered it up slowly with a Variac and all the tubes lit up and it seemed to be basically working. So I gave it a more thorough cleaning, disassembled and cleaned the graticule, straightened some dents in the case, and then looked at some of the circuitry. I measured the resistor values. I actually found two 2 watt resistors that drive the CRT were a little high in value, so I replaced those. The rest seemed okay, although most had drifted high, as is pretty typical for old carbon composite resistors and equipment of this age. The trace was still a little erratic, which is often a symptom of leaky caps. So I decided to replace all of the paper caps with new ones, as I suspected at least some of them were bad. Uh, I had to order some from the vendor JustRadios.com, including some high voltage 1600 volt 0.1 microfarad caps, which they carry. These are actually the originals. These have to be the largest paper caps that I've ever seen. These are marked Aerovox. They all look like they're made by Aerovox, but uh, it's interesting that the smaller ones are actually marked Daystrom. Heathkit's parent company. After replacing the caps, I tested these with a cap tester, my Heathkit IT11, and several of them did test bad for leakage. The line cord was in a little bit rough shape, so I replaced that with a new one using a brown six-foot extension cord that I purchased from Home Depot that's a, quite similar to the original one. I also replaced the electrolytic caps with new ones. The originals were a combination of some individual caps, like these ones here, and some multi-section ones that have three or four caps within one can. I replaced those with separate discrete caps. Uh, one of them fit on the printed circuit board, the others I mounted on a terminal strip. So in all I replaced 17 paper caps and 11 electrolytics, as well as these two power resistors that I found that were quite far off in value. After that component replacement, I performed the test and calibration procedure that was in the manual. This included adjusting an internal trimmer pot for the best spot focus. And then the trace is checked for being horizontal and the CRT rotated if needed to correct this. Then you adjust the frequency compensation of the vertical amplifier on the times 10 and times 100 ranges by connecting a jumper from the horizontal in signal on the back and adjusting some trimmer caps on the front left of the chassis so that the display becomes a straight line. This is similar to on more modern scopes where you may have a square wave input and you can adjust the compensation on the scope probes. The two horizontal sweep frequency presets can be adjusted by using a signal generator set to the desired frequencies and then adjusting the trimmers through the holes in the front panel. As mentioned, these are often used for the television horizontal and vertical sweep frequencies for convenience during TV servicing. Here's a 1 MHz sine wave coming from a signal generator being displayed. So basically you pick a suitable vertical gain range and level, adjust the horizontal gain and sweep frequency range, and adjust the frequency vernier for a stable display. As I mentioned earlier, if we calibrated the input against a known signal, we can measure the voltage of the input signal. There's a 1 volt peak-to-peak -peak reference output provided for this. I measured this one at 0.485 volts RMS or 1.37 volts peak-to-peak, -peak. so it wouldn't be very accurate to use this as a reference. It's based on the line voltage, so it will vary, and it's based on a nominal 115 volt line voltage, which is typically more like 120 volts today. A resistive divider is used to bring it down to 1 volt peak-to-peak, and as typical, the resistors used for this have drifted quite a bit in value. I may still replace the resistor dividers with new ones that are more accurate, but one of them is an odd value that I didn't happen to have on hand. So the scope is spec as having a 5 MHz bandwidth. That's quite a generous spec as the gain is down about 5 dB at 5 MHz. The plus or minus 1 dB bandwidth spec is 2.5 MHz, which is a more realistic spec. Note that it doesn't go down to DC because it's capacitively coupled, so it's accurate down to about 8 Hz. Now here's an example of XY mode. I've switched the horizontal to line frequency sweep, and I'm using the 1 volt peak-to-peak -peak calibration input for the vertical input. This results in what's called a Lissajous waveform, which appears as a circle when the horizontal and vertical frequencies are the same. We can adjust the phase control to get an open circle, or any phase that we want. 
These Lissajous waveforms can be used to accurately measure frequency given a known frequency as a reference. I've got a funny device I bought from SparkFun Electronics that turns a scope in XY mode into a clock. So here it is showing the input. Unfortunately the display is rotated 90 degrees because of the way the horizontal input polarity works. As a final example I've connected the Z axis input on the back to a signal generator. This signal adjusts the brightness of the trace. I'll just turn the level up of the signal generator. By feeding a square wave into the z-axis input, we get an interesting pattern with signals only shown in some portions of the waveform. This is a square wave running at about 75 hertz. In summary, the IO-12 was a higher-end model of scope offered by Heathkit during this era. It provided basic scope functionality, which is quite impressive with a design that only uses a few vacuum tubes. It supports XY mode and a z-axis input and has a calibrated vertical axis. The bandwidth was just adequate for radio and TV work and it has presets for two sweep frequencies that were typically set to television vertical and horizontal sweep frequencies. Its main limitations were the limited accuracy in the vertical channel, no calibration in horizontal, and sync but not triggered sweep, and a limited bandwidth specced at 5 MHz but only accurate up to about 2.5 MHz. Incidentally, for users who wanted a dual-channel scope, Heathkit offered an electronic switch that would add this capability to a single-channel scope. See my YouTube video on the Heathkit S3 for details. This unit is pretty large and heavy compared to modern scopes. They're typically digital and now use LCD or LED displays. There's really little circuitry in common between the older scopes like this and the newer ones, but they still operate basically the same way with similar controls. This scope is still adequate for basic testing of things like radio and television circuits, and there are people who restore old radios using vintage test equipment of the same era like this. I hope you enjoyed this video on the Heathkit IO-12 oscilloscope. If you did, see my other videos on vintage test equipment and radios.